Boy, it's good to see this building full. Good to see all of you here today. And I want to want to talk to you about something that's been on my mind for a bit because I've oop, didn't work first time, I guess. Is that better? Yes, that's better. I have four children, 12 grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. What, dear? Ooh. Man, I'm having a hard time this morning. Like, like it's this morning. I have a hard time with technology all, all together. But with all of those kids a raisin, I've heard one question more times than I care to even think about. Do I have to? Uh -huh. And it comes back to things that are so important in life. Do I have to go to church? Be out there in the yard playing and all uh, having fun and everything and I say, I'll whistle. I had, I had, at that time I was able to whiffle because I had teeth. but. Uh, I, I'd whistle and they'd come running. The rule was don't ever get too far away that you can't hear my whistle. So they'd hear my whistle and they'd come running. I'd say, come on in, you gotta get ready when going to church. Do I have to go? Oh, that was a tiresome question. Because no, no, we don't have to go. My view was we get to go. There's something about the difference there that I want to talk about. There are some folks that don't like to sing. And I, you know, when my voice is not doing well, I don't like to sing because I, I have such a hard time. I can't find the pitch. I can't, it just, it's rough when you're, when you can't sing. What you used to love to do, you can't do anymore. So it, it gets to where you're, yeah, oh. But we don't have to sing. We get to sing. What about giving? Do we have to give? You know, Bill made a good point about the blessings that we have. We, we are blessed beyond all the people on this earth. And sometimes it's harder for us to give than it is for people who don't have anything. And I, I always come back in my mind to that widow that had the two copper coins and she gave more with what she gave than all the people, the rich people in Jerusalem. And Jesus was standing there watching them go and put their money in the box. And he said she gave more than all the rest of them. There was a difference. She didn't have to. What about be baptized? What about that one? Do we have to be baptized? No. No, you don't have to be baptized. I don't have to be baptized. Nobody has to be baptized. But be careful now. Be careful how you consider that statement because we have something that nothing else in the creation has. We have freedom. Nobody holds a gun to our head. You know, you, you, you find a girl that you like, you, ooh, yes. How well would it be if you had to hold a gun to her head every time you wanted to kiss? That doesn't work. That won't work for that won't work the first time. That won't work for any time because you can't force somebody to love you. So it's a choice. It's a choice. We're not like the fish. When I first went to Alaska, Let's see, what year? That was in 1964. I can't remember the name of the river, but I was standing on the bank of the river, and it was about 12, 14 feet wide, just kind of a stream instead of a big river. But it was red. The whole river was red. It was red from salmon that were swimming upstream to lay their eggs. You could have walked on the backs of salmon and never touched the water. There were that many. They didn't do that because they had a choice. 
They did that because they were programmed to do it and they were gonna do it when their time came. Every, se I think it's seven years, that they would swim up the river and they would lay their eggs and then the, the ones that laid them would die and fresh ones would go out to the ocean and seven years later it happened all over again. They didn't have a choice. I was trying to find this morning how, how many Canadian geese they think there are that fly from north to south and I, I found out something I didn't know. There's about 12 different varieties of Canadian geese. And they not only fly north and south in North America, but they also do it in Asia and Europe. They come from Siberia. And I don't know why they still call them Canadian geese, but they, <laughs> Siberian geese, <laughs> I guess it would be. But they still do it, and they don't have a choice. There's a statement in Genesis chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel, where God makes a statement about mankind, and mankind has gone wrong, and they're trying to build a tower. They want to take over. They're going to build a tower to heaven, and they're going to be there to rule. That was what I get out of it anyway. And the Lord says, Whew, they, they've got one language, and if we don't do something, here's the thing. He says, if we don't do something, Nothing they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Nothing. They pur now that was evil. That was evil that he says nothing that they want to do will be impossible for them. Because we have choice. They had a choice to do whatever they wanted to do and they could be nearly invincible at that with that choice. But understand that choices have consequences. We have this choice and those choices, we need to think about the consequences. I want you to read in Deuteronomy with me. In Deuteronomy, beginning in chapter 11 and verse 26, here's where the Lord is giving Moses these commands about what to do now that they're in, in this land. He says, see today that I am setting before you a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen. If you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today. And the curse, if you do not listen to the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside from the way which I am commanding you by following other gods which you have not known. Truly, mankind has a choice. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to sing in praise to God. You don't have to give a nickel or two copper coins to serve the Lord. Oh, let me back up on that. <laughs> That's not the way to say that. You don't have to give it. But to serve the Lord, you choose to do it. In Joel chapter 2, I don't know what that ticking is, but it's driving me crazy. In Joel chapter 2, we have the story of Israel that has gone so bad that God has sent locusts upon them. And I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but the thought still lingers in my mind that they were so bad that God sent this physical, earthly punishment on them. The locusts, which have no choice, they don't have a choice, they didn't say, no, no Lord, we're not going. We're not going. Now the people had done that, that's why the locusts were going. And the locusts were sent by God to destroy their land. So the first wave of these locusts comes in. And it takes all the green off the trees, the leaves. Have you ever seen what happens when grasshoppers come in by the, th by the jillions? I've been in that situation. It happened in Washington State not too long back. And uh, the wheat harvest, at the, at, at, when it was really green, it just destroyed. It just destroyed everything. That was just one wave of the locusts that came in and ate the leaves off of the trees, ate everything that was green. And the people didn't change, so God sent another wave of locusts, and it ate the bark off the trees. 
And then he sent another wave, and it was the gnawing locusts, and ate, they ate the trees, and ate the roots, and they ate everything. So there was nothing but bare ground left when they, when they were done. And here's what God said to his people after three opportunities and they didn't turn, here's what he said to them. He says, yet even now, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. That's what God wants in the first place, is a heart. You can't get the heart with a gun. You can't get the heart by force. You can't get the heart any other way than by voluntarily being given the heart. That's why David was such an important person in our lives. Because it refers to David as a man after seeking, wanting God's heart. He had it. Even though he was sinful at times, David had God's heart because God could see that in his son, David. It's why he chose David to be the forefather of Jesus. He says, rend, I want to read the rest of this, verse 13 again. I want you to rend your hearts. What in the world does that mean? Rend your heart. Do you know what rend means? Kind of tear it apart, rip it up. They had a habit, these, these people. I mean, it wasn't a habit, it was a custom. That when something terrible happened, what they would do is they would tear their clothes like Superman, just rip their shirt. And that's how they demonstrated their grief. They did a lot of things flashy like that. They would weep and mourn. Not only would they weep and mourn, but they would hire people to come in and wail. They would call a, that, that's what a wake was. It was this wailing party where, that they would hire people to come in. And it just, you get a dozen people doing that and it lets everybody in the countryside know that you're in grief. The Lord says, I, what I want you to do is I want you to tear your hearts, not your garments. Don't make an awful lot of noise about it. Just make yourself sorry. Make yourself sorry. Big and flashy doesn't really do anything. I, I, it, it's hard for me to express this without using somebody and something that happened years ago. But I had a friend named Dennis. Still have him. I mean, he's still alive. I won't say his last name, but Dennis had a brother. Totally, completely opposite in, in almost every way. Dennis was a very meek and mild individual. His brother was just the opposite. Dennis was rather small and his brother was huge. Dennis was very kind and giving, and his brother was just the opposite. Dennis was caring for his father and mother, and his brother wasn't. <laughs> Dennis would go anytime they needed something, he would be there right on the spot. He would call them on a daily or weekly basis. His brother, they wouldn't hear from him for a year. Wouldn't even call him. Sometimes the the, uh, the brother would show up with some big fancy gift that nobody asked for, nobody needed, and nobody wanted. This big, expensive, fancy gift. And he expected praise for the big and the fancy gift. When he wasn't doing the daily things that show that you care about somebody, that didn't show love. That didn't show concern. That wasn't the kind of thing that God even wants. You know, it kind of reminds me, and I couldn't, I couldn't get this on here, but I want to turn to Amos chapter 5, 
And I want us to read uh, chapter 8 and verse 5. I want you to read with me here. It says, here's what the people were saying. And Amos is recording this for God to the people so that they can see themselves the way God saw them. You know, it's interesting to me that that's the way the Bible is written. And that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 will be the end of the gifts, you know, the gifts of prophecy and the gift of knowledge and the gift of all of these things. When all of those parts are put together and we have the perfect, he says the partial will be done away. He says, then we will know just as we have been fully known. Here's how God saw these people and how God now wants them to see themselves. Here's what they said about worship. Do we have to go to church? When will the new moon be over? Here's this period of time that the Jews had to wait. They couldn't sell. They couldn't do their business. They had to had to close the doors. They had to had to wear a mask. They had, <laughs> no, never mind that. that that doesn't fit very well. When will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath so that we may open the wheat market to make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger? Oh, not only were they wanting the Sabbath to be over so that they could do business, but they wanted to cheat. <laughs> they were... They were faking the, the weights and the measures. They were, they were shorting the people on the grain that they sold for, a, for a, a heavier weight or a lighter weight. He says, to cheat with dishonest scales so as to buy the helpless for money. What in the world did the Sabbath mean to these people anyway? I mean, why would you go to church and then hope to get out of church so that you can go cheat people. What's the point in all of that? Why would that even be in a, in a system of religious people? It's because they weren't religious. It was because they were doing what they did for some other reason. It wasn't because of their love of God. So here's my question for us. We are people. We're people just like these people. We're people who have the same kind of tendencies that these Jewish people had. And here's how God felt about them when they said, Do we have to go to church? Do we have to sing? Do we have to give? Do I have to be baptized? He said, and they sell the needy for a pair of sandals, that we may sell the refuse of the wheat. They're not just selling the wheat, but they're selling the chaff in the wheat. You know, not only are they weighting the scales differently, and not only are they making the shekel different, but they're also mixing the wheat with the chaff and selling it for wheat. I mean, this is totally dishonest, all the way to the bone, dishonest. That's what people do. That's why we can talk ourselves into anything if our heart's not right. That's why you can see a, mis a, a, a miscarriage of justice out there somewhere and you can use that miscarriage of justice that you had nothing to do with, that ha didn't happen to you, and you can use it as an excuse to go burn your neighbor's house down and steal his property. That ought not to be, folks. And then go to church on Sunday. No. No. Do you think that the Lord is smiling at that? I think he's saying just exactly what he has said to the rest of them. Beware, the locusts may be on their way to this nation if we don't do something to curb this. Amen. That's right. 
Now, I want to get back to a, a better note. Singing, that's a better note, right? <laughs> Y'all know my mother-in-law, call her grandma, Floydine. Floydine lived a long and very righteous life. She was a wonderful lady. I called her mom because for many years she was just my mom. She was my wife's mother, but she couldn't have been any more my mom unless she gave birth to me. But I'll tell you what, watching that woman over the years, honestly, have you ever sat by and, and listened to her sing? <laughs> But one thing I totally enjoyed, I enjoyed going into her house because any time I walked through those doors, she was singing some gospel song. Now, I know one thing she never asks. Do I have to sing? You couldn't keep her from singing. And the reason she sang is because she believed what she was singing or she used it as a tool to make herself better. She had, had verses of songs that she had taped to the refrigerator. Because she loved the thought of it. And she didn't see it as something that she was lying about if she hadn't reached it yet. She saw it as an aspiration. She saw it as something that she was reaching for, and she was reaching for it because she believed in all of this. You know, if you're hoping for the Sabbath to be over so you can get back into business, you don't believe in this. You're not believing in what Jesus is and what he claimed to be and what he has to offer. That would be like in John chapter 1 where it says, He came unto His own. That's us. And His own did not receive Him. Most of us don't. And the ones who did receive Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God. The right to. You have a chance to if you believe in Him. You have the right to start that process. And that process is wanting to do all of these things that we're talking about. Do I have to sing? No. Do I want to? Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to do it and do it well. I'd like to do it and sing about things that help me to think about the kind of person that I ought to be. I like to sing about things that tell me about what life is going to be when this one is over, when we realize that new heaven and new earth wherein righteousness dwells. Where we're not going to have to worry about somebody getting mad about what's done to somebody else and burning my house down and taking my TV. She couldn't help herself. She sang every day. And she chose to sing and to obey that uh, first commandment. Remember what the first commandment was? Well, somebody tell me what the first commandment is. <coughs> Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. What's the second one? To love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two things depend the whole law and the prophets. To me, that tells me that every word written in that Bible of ours is designed to teach one four-letter word and the two different approaches to it. Daryl, can you move that pack to a front pocket flap where it's not up against your side? <laughs> is that what's causing all that? I think it's pressing up against the <laughs> Thank you, buddy. <laughs> uh, I'm, I was just hoping it'd electrocute me and I could cut my suspenders and go straight up. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you why that woman sang. She sang because she loved God. 
She sang because she wanted to do the will of God. Now, here's what Joel also said. He said, Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. I want to end with two thoughts. I started with one, that is that we have a choice, right? We can totally disobey God. We don't have to do a thing he says. We're the only part of his creation that can say no to him. And we can. And most do. No. No. I will not. You can't make me. I saw someone say something like that the other day. I was too old to slap him. I'd have got hurt. But I, I, I sure wanted to. But there's two sides to that. Not only do we have a choice, so does God. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua makes one of the most profound speeches. It's found anywhere. And Jake read it this morning. Standing before Israel, he's about to leave. He's, he's ended his life. He's done everything. You know, Joshua is one of the... Uh, one of the only people in the Bible that it says nothing bad about. You find something bad about Joshua, keep it to yourself. I don't want to know. Uh, I, I'm happy seeing someone that there's nothing bad written about. But Joshua says, you, you folks out there, you choose for yourself who you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Then we have the statement made by Isaiah in chapter 1, verse 18, where he says, Come, folks. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. There's nothing unreasonable about the gospel. There's no, no, nothing unreasonable about anything that God asks of us because everything that he asks of us, he's already done for us in the, in the past. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. That means it's reasonable, right? That means that there is logic, there's reason, there's, there's nothing weird about this. It's all for our good. And then in Hebrews chapter 11, there's a statement that's made about Abraham. Abraham's one of those individuals that had his ups and his downs. I, I, I look at Abraham and he's a, he's a picture. Considered by everybody to be the, the, the foundation of the whole civilization. But here's a man that was a brave man one day and a coward the next. Abraham was the father of a nation, yet... He was willing to trade his wife for his own safety. Ah, that, that, how many times would that happen? <laughs> uh, if my wife had a choice, that, that wouldn't even happen the first time because I'd, I'd be out the door. Abraham was the man who would take 318 men and go chase five kings. And one. And one. He was a man that came back and did the same thing with his wife again because he was afraid. God saved him that time, but does that make any sense to you? What it makes sense to me is that he's human. He makes mistakes like we do. Yet, here's what Abraham did. When God comes to him and he says in Genesis chapter 22, he said, and this is, the account is in Hebrews 11. But in Hebrews 11, it says, when God came to him and said, I want you to take your son, your only son, the son that I promised everything to you with, and I want you to go up and kill him on the mountain. It says, Abraham considered, considered. Abraham reasoned. 
Abra do you think Abraham just took that command, go kill your son, and woke up cheerful the next morning and, come on, boy, let's go? I have such a hard time with that because I understand that that was written for us to understand how much God was willing to give for our salvation. I know he fretted all night. But during that fretting, as he w twisted and turned on his bed, Abraham considered, well, the Lord did this, and the Lord did that, and I did this, and the Lord did that. And the next morning, he took Isaac, and he went to the mountain because he trusted what God had said. So, that's why we get to Joel 2.12. And the Lord says, yet even now, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what I've done. What matters is the reason that we want to continue. Here's one thing that just always impressed me so much about God is that our God is from now on. Do you understand that? Do you realize what that means? That our God is a from now, this moment on God. Doesn't matter about the past. Whatever that is, the blood of Jesus will make it right if we receive him and trust him and obey him because we want to not because we have to. It's a want to thing. That's why in Matthew 24, we have this scene. The scene of the sheep and the goats. This scene of a, a wedding ceremony. And that's, I think, your favorite, your favorite passage. The Lord calls all these people to a wedding. And one of them he throws out. Get out of here. Get out of here. Because he wasn't dressed the way he was supposed to dress. You know, in Galatians it tells us that those of us who have been baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. We put him on like a garment. That's why we can go through those gates squeaky clean because we're clothed in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's right. God has choices too. Through baptism. Yes. When the Lord said to Nicodemus, you must be born again you don't have to because you can stay dead if you want to it's that simple but if you want to live it's a choice I set before you today a blessing and a curse the blessing if you listen the curse if you don't the lesson is yours I hope that you will see the wisdom in making the right choices because we all make them every day and those choices wind up being just one last thought that I want to give you. We're three part beings. Most people say two part beings but I, I see a third part. We're a spirit that God gives us that's holy it's God's the peace of God we're children of God we're his offspring and then we have an earthen vessel that he puts all of that into that's the two parts that most people talk about the third part is the soul that is what we make of both of those two that's what is eternal that soul is what determines who we are, what we are, whether God loves us, 
well, he loves us, but whether he likes us or not, what have we done with our soul? What have we made it into? Lesson is yours. If you subject to the gospel call, please make your life right this morning as we stand to sing the song that Ron has for.